Okay, welcome. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you about the AI tools uh, on the speech that I named the death or elevation of creative work. Uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different from the other ones mainly because I'm not going to be talking about uh, technical aspects or methods. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Gaspar Jagar and I'm head of creative production and growth team. And the reason why I uh, agreed to do this talk is because I have a very uh, very big variety of, of creative experience, right? So I've been working for about 12 years in content creation uh, in fields like photography, video production, gaming. And I've been uh, working in various positions in these fields, right? Everything from production to organizational to creative to artistic. Uh, so I've worked as, you know, artists kind of like to say, I've worked for clients and I've been a client in these transactions when it comes to creative work. So that's why I thought it would be very interesting to talk about AI tools in general. Um, we'll talk about should you be afraid of AI tools? Should you be excited about them? Or maybe, you know, something else completely. Uh, and I really want you to get another perspective out of this because uh, no matter how I talk to people, there's always either one aspect uh, about AI tools, maybe they love it, maybe they are excited about it, maybe they just see, you know, wow, uh, much more for much less work. So anyways, I just want you to take a look from a different perspective. Why? Well, two things happened when Creative AI appeared, especially in, in companies like ours. Uh, there was anger and fear, mainly on the artistic side of people. Um, that artists are becoming less valuable, that artistic work doesn't matter anymore, that the skills don't matter anymore, right? So why not just write up a prompt instead of having somebody hired and, uh, you know, to draw something, to illustrate something. And um, there was excitement on the other side of things, especially on the leadership side, right? Awesome, right? You know, well, how many models can we buy? How much can we generate? It's all about Excel sheets and, you know, like you put in money and like Papami generates stuff out. And there are legitimate, um, I'm going to say, points to each one of these. Uh, and normally one does not understand the other, but I get both because I've been doing both of these sides of things. And I want to dive into this a little bit more because neither one of these logics is actually right. They both are partially, but neither one is uh, right completely. To start off this presentation, I'm going to start talking about horseshit. Good, I got a reaction. That's what I was aiming for. Uh, Specifically, I want to, and Daniel here is thinking, why did we give this guy a microphone, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about the great horse manure crisis. Uh, so at the, at the beginning of 20th century, uh, this is the time of industrial revol revolution, cities were getting big, but these cities have been uh, living on horses, right? There were no cars yet. Uh, even public transport was operated by horses, like drawing carriages and like buses and stuff. And I have some numbers for you here. So London, we had... 50,000 horses, and these are daily numbers, right? So I'm talking in every single day inside the cities, there's been 50,000 horses on the streets of London. In New York, 100,000 horses, and I double-checked this number, 100,000 horses produced 1,133 metric tons of shit daily, right? And you can see an image here, this was actually a very huge problem, and there are a lot of old articles from newspapers that the cities are beginning to be flooded by shit, literally. What this caused was that there was many jobs, many people had jobs, manual labor people who were cleaning this up because something had to be done, right? Yes, you know, a thousand tons daily, it needed to go somewhere. But this ended with car revolution, this ended with sewage system implementation, basically all the benefits that came from the industrial revolution. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning is this, because this is not the type of job that evolved, right? This is the type of job that disappeared. And it's one of the many jobs, like for example, before electricity, people were lighting street lamps that were being powered by oil. That's a job that disappeared. And we live in a time of AI revolution, right? So people say, we, we read the articles, uh, we, we hear about it. But I really think there's a big difference in these two revolutions, right? So. Um, 
the way I perceive it is industrial revolution changed the world because after centuries of living by the same rules, certain jobs actually disappeared, right? This was a huge change to our way of living. And yes, people transitioned, they were doing something else, like they got other jobs because there were other needs. But the point here is that it was a very big disruption, hence the revolution. And when we talk about the AI revolution, the change will come to your workflow. The change will not come to the cancellation of jobs, not maybe in the way you're thinking about it. Um, the AI revolution is way more similar to what happened when computers came, to when internet came. So when computers came, everybody was like, if you, if you check old like, articles and stuff, computers will take your jobs. Right? That's, that's the classic thing that us humans do when something new comes and disrupts something. Computers didn't take your jobs, but you all got a computer at your job, right? So there's like almost no jobs today without any, like some sort of computers. Um, and really the trick here is to consider AI as a tool. AI is another brush, another lens, another pen for you to use to be able to create experiences easier, faster, and most of all in bigger quantities in shorter amount of time. Now, before I go further, I just wanted to put us all on the same page, right? Let's define what AI actually means, because it's a term that's being flopped around everything these days, like in every article. And uh, technically, the idea is this, right? In the classic algorithm, in the tool, you, uh, when you write something, if, then, right? This is the loop that every developer knows. When something happens, then you do this or that or that based on the parameters. And the general idea of machine learning AI is that you have a bunch of inputs, you define the goal, and what happens in between, you don't care, you don't know about it, it might completely surprise you. So you learn, you make the system being able to figure out the steps it needs to take to reach the end goal. That's, that's the biggest difference. Um, and why are we experiencing this now? Well, uh, as you've heard on the previous talk, if you've been listening to it, it's the computing power, right? There was no way to do this 20 years ago, uh, but today, given the amount of data that we have, like flooding the internet, and given the processing power that we have, this finally became realistic. Now, I do want to say this. Uh, you, you all know this. Not everything that shines is gold, right? It's a, it's a, it's a folk proverb that I think exists in every language. And I also want to say that not everything with an AI sticker is necessarily AI. Uh, there's something wrong. It's a Windows computer. Sorry, guys. It's not my computer. This would not have happened on Mac, just saying. Um, so there's not necessarily everything with an AI sticker that is an AI, right? Um, and I really want to say this. This is crypto all over again. Everybody remembers a few years back, every second person that you met on the street had a white paper. Everybody had a coin. Everything was you know, blockchain this, blockchain that. And this really is a business strategy, because as soon as you hear, oh, we're making this awesome automatic tool that will you know, automatically cut and do shit and do everything. Oh, uh, you know, what is it? Oh, it's just you know, an advanced algorithm. Nah, we're not interested. Oh, we're making something AI. Take the money, take it, take it, take it more. You know, like, like just throw it and then we'll buy out quick and somebody else will deal with if it works or if it doesn't. And I want to give you an example here. GoPro Quick. GoPro had an app years ago that automatically cut videos out of your clips and made the video so that it was easy to share on social, right? Overnight, it became AI editing tool, right? Like maybe they've been actually doing this from before. I'm not saying this is not 100%, but you know, the sticker came on because it was expected. Everything today needs to be AI. Tesla now has self-driving, which is AI. It wasn't a year ago, right? But now it's AI. And Photoshop, content aware fill. You mask something, you click, it disappears, it replaces it. Is it AI or is it just a very well-trained normal algorithm? Today it's AI, right? Like last year it wasn't. Um, so this is what I'm just saying. Be critical to when you, when you see tools, when you read about it. Maybe you know how it's built, maybe it's not. Maybe sometimes it's only, it, it is AI, but it's shitty AI and it's not working properly. But be critical and don't just buy everything that is AI, right? Some tools are, some tools are really powerful, but it, not all of them. Um, so, on the previous talk, we heard a lot about 
the generative AI. So I'm not going to go specifically into this, but I do want to um, bring some attention to other tools as well, which I think will bring a lot of benefits to the creative fields. So generative AI, that's one thing. Uh, I especially do think that generative AI within Photoshop with other Adobe tools is going to be something extremely powerful or bringing, on <coughs> bringing already powerful things to already, you know, such a powerful software. Uh, we have chatbots, and you know, from, as somebody who uses a lot of ChatGPT, it really is Google on cocaine, right, or, or on steroids. It's just a better, better user experience. As like a year ago, you've been googling everything. Ten years ago, when you googled something, you had to open up links, you had to read the articles. Now Google gives you answers, and ChatGPT just you know answers back like a friend. So it takes away the effort and gives you the information. Um, Visual manipulators. This is, um, I have a big affection for stable diffusion because I saw some projects that were being done that I'll mention, mention now later that enabled small teams uh, to create works that would have otherwise taken the millions and would have taken several hundred people, let's say over two years of time, and like five guys did something amazing in a week. Right? So this is the great, great benefit. Procedural tools. In 3D works, Unreal, Houdini, Blender, right? You set up stuff and it creates massive environments for you based on specific rules. And video motion capture. Video motion, motion capture is um, an amazing thing that people like to use to make movies and everything. And today you have a flood of apps that just take one recording from your phone, make you motion capture data, and then you apply that on 3D. It cuts out uh, on you buying very expensive gear and saves a lot of time on animating your characters. So, why are we here, right? Why are we going into AI as a species? Well, human brain was developed here on Earth, right? In our gravity. And biologically speaking, we were not, we were built to experience the world with our senses, right? So visual, audio, sense, everything else, basically like the monkey swinging from a tree, you needed to survive in the nature. But because we're smart, because we wanted to experience other stuff, we had to develop tools to measure other things which were not perceivable by our senses. And AI is just another tool, a more advanced tool, which we will use to develop more stuff. And as an example of this, I put here AlphaFold. I don't know if you've heard about this before, but this is a, um, an AI model that was used by a research company to develop 200 million 3D protein structures which was basically one of incredibly complex issues of modern science. And what this gives us is it unlocks um, new medicines, it unlocks secrets of diseases that we've been exploring because this is a, apparently an issue that science has been stuck with for decades and it has been solved in a matter of days because they used an AI model, they fed it the data and it came up with this. So if we want to move forward, if we want to do things faster and better, we need better tools, and AI is just another tool. <clears throat> but I mentioned before the fear, right, and especially in the creative fields. There's been animation in every, pretty much every field uh, that humans use. Creative, uh, <laughs> well, a lot of things have been happening traditionally for, for decades, right? If, if you take illustrations, for example, the biggest disruption that ever happened was when photography came and all illustrators were like, oh, who's going to want portraits now? Like, everybody's going to take photos. Um, and, and I've been hearing these two sentences a lot from people, right? I've been learning for years and now people make it with a click. And uh, my skills don't matter anymore because everybody can do it. And I want to say at this point, right, um, what's, what's your perception? Like AI tools came out, MidJourney came out, and all of a sudden now you're thinking this. Did you think this way when um, new features come to Photoshop, to After Effects, to other 3D software, when Content Aware Fill came out, or like when uh, automated masking came to Photoshop, you click something and it automatically selects an item? Nobody was screaming, it's going to take my job. Right? Everybody was like, awesome, like less work, right? less you know, pen tools, less everything, less fixes. I can do work faster, I can be better. And then AI came and a bunch of blogs and you know, news were like, oh, revolution or something. And then creatives were like, it's going to take my job. And yeah, it got weird. Everybody always welcomed optimization, new features. 
Um, but AI tools labeled as intelligent got people scared, right? So I, I really want to know, like, was anybody ever worried for the job because content-aware fuel came in? And it's basically this, right? It's an AI tool. You, you mask something and it does it by itself. By definition, it's an AI generative tool. And um, some slides ago, I, I mentioned uh, experiences. And I really think this is a very big thing that artists specifically need to focus on, right? Um, the biggest, I, I had a discussion with one of the artists. And it was like, you know, I, uh, nobody will respect my, basically, my brush strokes now, my skills as an artist. Like, I can draw something. I can make it realistic. Like, where's the respect of this? The perception of this uh, should be different, right? This is my point of view. Like, and I'm not saying that the methods don't matter, but you need to think of yourself differently. Artists tend to focus way too much on just the method of execution. But really, whatever you're creating, right? Doesn't matter if you have an art gallery opening or if you open up a new blockbuster movie or if you're making a game. What you're doing is you're serving an experience. An audience on the other side walks around, takes a look at the image or sits in a the movie theater or you know, stays at home and plays the game overnight. It gets an experience, right? We all gain an experience. And it's really important to understand this because it's your creative mindset, the experience that you bring uh, that makes you the artist, that makes you a creative person. It's not the tools you use, it's not the methods you use. Um, it really, it's really important for you to know it's about the person and about the approach, not about the tools. Take games, for example, right? First games that came to Microsoft DOS, they weren't built with game engines, they were coded directly. We love them. Like, and if you compare that one to this one today, all you care about is the experience. Is it fun to play? Is it nice to play? Do you like it? You don't care how it was built, right? You don't care about the method behind it. <coughs> one second. <coughs> and as a, as a proof of this, I want to point your attention, right? So we've all seen recordings. Um, or like images or clips like on, on social media and everywhere of people who draw photorealistic images with their fingers on their phones. They're not using professional tools, right? Or you can see a very viral TikTok video that has hundreds of millions of views and it's not shot professionally. There's no professional gear behind it. There's no professional lighting. It's just one person making a very good piece of art, piece of creative work, and it gets attention because it brings a great experience. So let me, let me ask you this, right? When you watch a TV show, play a game or whatever, that you really love, do you care how it was made? When you watch, for example, let's say Lord of the Rings, right? The film that got 11 Oscars, the last one. Do you really care that the shot of Rohirrim riding up was digitally enhanced, right? Okay, yes, I mean, if they got actual 6,000 horsemen, like the fact that they would do that would be extra awesome, but your experience on screen doesn't matter, right? It's an awesome piece of work and it was digitally enhanced. There was something else about it. But the point here is they made some stuff digital, they made some stuff in real life, they built cities, but if you think about it, it doesn't really matter which one they did for that shot or for the other shot, it's your experience that matters. And, and this is the point I'm trying to make here. Virtual production, I have a, an example of it here with Mandalorian, it's something that Disney's using a lot these days. It just enables companies to build things faster. And for your eyes, for your experience when you're sitting at home and watching, it doesn't really matter if it was shot on a real location or in virtual because it looks the same. So the logic of AI tools really should be, I mean, it was shocking, it came fast, but you need to think about this. Um, and I have an example here. Maybe you know Corridor Crew, maybe you don't. Uh, it's a YouTube channel of guys who do visual effects and stuff. And they made an anime movie by recording it in life and then processing it through stable diffusion. And by doing that, they were able to make an anime, which normally takes months or like a year to two years, and uh, hundreds of people to draw every single frame by hand, and they made it in a week. Right? So they were able to make a medium that they care a lot about in a very short amount of time for a lot less money with a lot less people and they made a great experience, right? So the only thing that matters now is will you not watch it 
because it wasn't done the way that it was supposed to be done or are you going to enjoy it and you're going to ask for more, right? Because in theory, why would you wait every two years for 15 minutes of, of new anime if you can watch it weekly and if the content is good? Same thing goes for procedural generation, right? Um, there's a huge, huge CD right here. It's procedurally generated. Like you can ask my guys from the team back there how long it would take to set it up manually, to create every mesh, every texture, to paint it, to position it, and to do whole San Francisco like this together. Probably we would have, would have seen him in the next life, right? Because before he got out, it would take time. And um, really, really what you need to do is, you know, instead of focusing on what AI might take from you in terms of respect, like losing the value of, of artists, of methods that have been using, you should focus on what it gives you, and right? And, and as artists, as creative people, we need to focus on experiences, one way or another. And by doing that, we're not devaluing methods and techniques, right? If you think construction, if you see somebody build a house by hand, you have a great respect for that. It takes him a couple of years, right? But they do it, and there's people on YouTube who do things like that. They build things by hand. But it's not something that we as a species can continue doing, right? If you want to build a highway from here to Berlin, you don't want to do it by hand, right? You want to use construction uh, equipment, you want to use bulldozers, you want to use something that speeds up your work. And the ability to use AI really, um, really gives you now opportunities to make things that were not possible before. And the, the, the biggest trick in creative fields is now you can do it by yourself or like with the less amount of people. Maybe what we need is better content, right? Let me draw your attention to latest TV shows on Disney, right? Everything is crap, basically, because it's made for 14 year olds. There's no depth, there's no content. Wouldn't you like for there to be better content out there? And maybe people who have that content, who are able to write it, can now realize it because it takes less people to make something. Because otherwise, again, if you look backwards in movies and TV series, you need to write something, you need to know people to pitch it to a studio, right? They were very specific people who were incredibly lucky in the past that were able to get their creative stuff out. But now, with internet and with these tools being available, with these methods being so powerful, your imagination really does become the only limit. Why am I bothering you with this? Because um, I don't want you to be afraid, right? I don't want you to be afraid of AI. AI is not going to take your job. Who will take your job is a person who knows how to use AI, who can adapt to a system, who can make things faster, cheaper, better, uh, who can, can raise up on quantity. And like I told you before, people were afraid of computers. Everybody uses computers now. Everybody uses internet now. And you must use AI to dump shit on it to do work that you don't want to do, right? The, the great thing about AI is that it's able to solve things faster than you are, and it can take away the mundane and leave you with the stuff that you really care about. And, you know, like I told you, if this was a construction business, you would go for the cost-effective thing. No, nobody here, I guess, like if you're building a house, wants to wait for 10 years for somebody to build it by hands, right? You want to move in quickly. And the same logic applies to, to creative work. Companies need content fast. They need it quick and they need it to be cost-effective, right? Nobody wants to wait for 10 years for the next awesome game just because it needs to be drawn by hand, like in every single little thing. And um, it's human nature to want more. Think about factories. When automation came to factories, we didn't hire all the people, kept the factories of, you know, like, like this room size. No, we built gigafactories. We even, Musk even names them gigafactories, right? We built more and more and more because that's, the human logic. As soon as something becomes available, we want more of it. We want it faster, we want it better, and we don't stop. This is why AI is not going to replace you. This company is not going to suddenly drop half of its people, but it's going to want half of its people to use AI to generate more. So AI is here. If you like it or if you don't like it, fact is it's here, right? It's the new tool, it's the new computer, and like I said, it's not going to be your replacement. Human factor does not disappear when AI comes in. AI can do a lot faster, maybe better, maybe with better quality, but it needs input, Like right? When I told you uh, the ideas of the algorithms before, there needs to be an input in order for there to be an output. And the input is the thing 
where you as a creative person make something different. Meet journey by itself cannot make art. It needs an input. It needs the command, imagine something, right? And if you don't imagine it, it's not going to generate it. AI doesn't have imagination. It doesn't convey emotions. It doesn't have motivations. It has an objective, right? There's an input and there's got to be an output. So you will always be a factor in it. And you need to use it to work smart, to automate, focus on the hands-on aspect where you need to because you know it will be added value because you want to, because you can, and make sure you use it where it's relevant, right? When AI came, what happened? What happened in every company? M management came in and said, AI, who uses it? Who doesn't use it? You, like, you need AI, you need AI, everybody needs AI, right? Same thing and with TikTok came. We all need to do TikTok. Same thing with crypto came. Like, should we go blockchain? Maybe this didn't happen, but you know what I mean, right? Whenever something new comes in that has potential to be better, smarter, faster, companies want it. And you need to understand that, right? On the one hand, you have people who want to protect their jobs, their methods, their traditional values. But as people who are running the companies, they also need to make sure that the company is running as, as fluently as possible. And if new tools enable this, then why not give people new tools, right? And it's, it's, we're talking about addition of tools. We're not talking about replacing people for tools. And that's, that's a very important distinction. Um, and lastly, I do want you to know, like, keep in mind that not all AI, to AI tools are tools. I, I'm not going to point any fingers to specific ones. I have some in, in mind that I've tested personally. Maybe they're just bad, but don't just think that everything AI is equally effective, right? Like every software is not equally effective. And um, really let AI be another tool in your box that you can use, right? Uh, it's here for you to use it where you need it, whatever, in whatever way you need it. And um, really, I'm going to leave you with this. Tools can, maybe will become obsolete. Uh, but your mindset, your know-how, your thinking cannot become obsolete. Like, your skills are transferable. There were people who were doing puppet animation who made the first Star Wars movies. And in the, se in the second and the third, they were using CG graphics. But those same people use those principles with a different set of tools to make other movies. So your skills, your ideas, how to convey experiences are the transferable skills. So don't be afraid of AI. Use your way of thinking and put AI in it and use it where it's applicable. Don't use it if it's not. But it's a tool, right? It's not you. Uh, it really is about the person. It's not about the tool. So don't be afraid. And thank you.